What happened with Ukraine's counteroffensive? Though we think of the war as being between these two men, a different pair lie at the heart of today's story. 2023 began with Ukraine and the West, basking in a newly born wave of optimism. When Vladimir Putin first announced Russia's invasion, the conventional wisdom was that Kyiv would have to quickly fold. Nevertheless, within a month, the attack on Kyiv had stalled out, eventually forcing Russia to pull back those troops. Ukraine lost significant land on the southern and eastern fronts during this period. But by summer, the conversations in the West turned to whether Ukraine could expel Russia entirely. Indeed, the trouble along the southeast was part of Ukraine's plan. The blue and yellow troops would split up. Some would man the front lines to limit further losses. The rest would shelter in the West, receive modern NATO training, and prepare for an offensive the following spring. Then came the curveball. Ukraine was not actually waiting. First was the September counteroffensive in Kharkiv. Then was the culmination of an ongoing counteroffensive in Kherson in November. The public narrative of the invasion shifted. It had become Ukraine's war to lose. The blue and yellow soldiers would hunker down for the winter. But come spring and more favorable weather, it would be back to retaking the Russian-conquered lands. However, with the sun having set on 2023, we know that this is not what happened. Ukraine made some small territorial gains east of the Hook in the Dnipro River, but they were nothing like the fall of 2022. Be that as it may, for whatever it is worth, enough time has now passed that we can begin writing in the history books some conclusions about what happened. Today, we are going to learn about one man's success in getting everyone to stop what they were doing, and the institutional structures that stopped another man from getting everyone going. This is the story of Ukraine's 2023 counteroffensive. Prologue. Retreat from Kherson. It is tempting to start the narrative of the 2023 counteroffensive in 2023 but likely the most consequential decision about it was actually made in 2022. The end of September and beginning of October that year was a wild period. The backdrop was the culmination of Ukraine's Kharkiv offensive. On September 21st, Putin declared the official mobilization of 300,000 soldiers, though many assessments put that number substantially higher. Beginning on September 23rd, Russia staged referenda on joining its federation in Luhansk, Donetsk, Zaporizhia, and Kherson. On September 26th, the Nord Stream pipeline was sabotaged. On September 30th, the Kremlin hosted an annexation ceremony for the four aforementioned oblasts. Almost no one else recognized it. On October 8th, the Crimean Bridge was bombed. And all the while, Ukraine was putting the pressure on Kherson city. At the start of the invasion, in the midst of extreme social distance in Moscow, and chaos everywhere in Ukraine, Russia chose to cross the Dnipro River near Kherson city, as soldiers attempted to capture territory all the way along the Black Sea. However, local Ukrainians put up unexpectedly tough resistance, and Russia never actually crossed the Second River. The invading soldiers' supplies ran low, and planners gave insufficient thought to supply lines that could rectify the situation. As a result, a pocket formed north of the Dnipro River, where Russian soldiers were functionally on an island, trying to prevent Ukraine from taking back Kherson city. Eventually, those Russian military planners learned how bad the logistical problem was. For the prior three months, they had been trying to ship as many men and as much materiel as possible, across the three bridges that spanned the Dnipro River. Ukraine, however, did not make this easy. Using a steady dose of HIMARS launches to put the bridges in various states of disrepair. But Russia got by, though the trouble on the Crimean Bridge added a new wrinkle to the situation. Nevertheless, with Ukraine closing in on Kherson come November, Russia faced an impending disaster. Back in Moscow, a still socially distant debate began about what to do next. Following the Russian failures in Kharkiv, Putin sought a change in military leadership. 
His answer was to promote a new commander of Russian forces in Ukraine, Sergei Surovikin. Surovikin had made a name for himself during Russia's intervention in the Syrian civil war, or at least a nickname for himself. He appeared to have a better understanding of Russia's military capabilities on the ground. In turn, he understood the true extent of how mismanaged the initial invasion was, and wanted to buy time to reset things. The key to this was an organized withdrawal from Kherson. If Ukraine replicated its successes from the north into the south, there may have been no way for Russia to recover. All Ukraine had to do was temporarily disable the bridges, something that HIMARS operators had made abundantly clear was within the realm of plausibility. With Russia stuck in place and the river at its back, Ukraine's attack afterward would have been a Russian bloodbath and a Ukrainian materiel gold mine. Without the Russian soldiers to redeploy across more defensible positions along the front line, Ukraine could have just kept on going, and going, and going, until Russia was completely expelled. However, Putin was reluctant. The signing ceremony from earlier had made Kherson City, from the perspective of Russian law, just as much a part of the Russian Federation as St. Petersburg or Moscow. This, itself, was a byproduct of the Special Military Operation Veneer. By not issuing a war declaration back in February, conscripted Russian soldiers were not supposed to venture outside of Russian territory. Hence, there was a creative solution. Instead, the Kremlin made those locations Russian territory. Except now Surovikin wanted to retreat from Russia. The uphill battle that it was, he still won the argument, apparently appealing to how military realities trump political inconveniences. Russia began its withdrawal from Kherson on November 9th, and completed it two days later. Ukrainian troops immediately re-entered the city, and Zelensky visited on November 14th. But the warm feelings belied a more difficult challenge to come. Act 1. The Drain for its part, Ukraine seemed well aware of Russia's manpower problems. September's mobilization would slowly alleviate those problems, but it did not appear to be enough to cover a front line that extended 1,500 kilometers. Seemingly, everything that Ukraine did for the following six months was geared toward exploiting that to some extent, and drain Russia of men. The Battle of Bakhmut was front and center to this, where Ukraine appeared to be perfectly happy to slowly trade territory for Russian casualties, even as the United States was pleading with Ukraine to retreat. The war also started to slowly creep onto Russian soil, with some combination of Ukrainian covert operations or Russian partisan attacks in Moscow and elsewhere. Then there was Belgorod. In June, Russian partisans explicitly used Ukrainian territory as a staging ground, to attack Russian border towns. The point of these actions was to force Russia into a map-based dilemma. Keep the front staffed, or distribute the security forces within Russia's vast interior, or along the longer pre-existing border. And then came the Wagner Mutiny, the now infamous private military company's rebellion spearheaded by Yevgeny Prigozhin. The Thunder Run on Moscow happened in the same June month, Although it was not an intentional part of Ukraine's plan, it was still a byproduct of holding on to Bakhmut for as long as possible. And it again forced Russia to think twice about moving more security forces into Ukraine. For its part, the Kremlin was well aware of the manpower issues that remained despite the mobilization. Putin's popularity took a brief hit in the wake of the announcement, as Russians wondered whether it would be broad enough to affect them personally. The approval numbers went back up afterward, but it was still enough to worry Putin. Instead, the answer was entrenchments. Surovikin spent the winter building a defensive line. The labor that troops put in acted as a force multiplier. Russia would still have benefited from more men, but this was better than nothing. Because he oversaw its construction, the series of fortifications came to be known as the Surovikin Line. Moreover, the ability to construct it was a direct consequence of his earlier decision to retreat from Kherson. 
The line would indeed prove pivotal later, but in June, its namesake would be thanked with an unceremonious firing under suspicion of being a secret Wagner member. Act 2. The Plan As spring rolled around and the weather cleared, Ukraine had a straightforward strategy. Ukrainian soldiers, some sent away more than a year earlier, were now returning home. With them came the knowledge of how to execute NATO combined arms operations. The defending Russian soldiers had set their trenches and deployed as well as they could to even out the risks. Now Ukrainian intelligence would have to find whatever weaknesses they could, build up troops in that area, and then launch the offensive. There was cause for optimism in Kyiv. Ordinarily, and broadly speaking, Defending armies have two groups of soldiers, those actually on the front lines, to prevent opposing soldiers from walking right through, and a mobile secondary, whose soldiers act as rovers. Once the opponent has revealed the location of an offensive, at least some of the secondary goes to shore up the front lines. However, stalling the first wave is a precondition for those rovers to be effective. This has a critical implication for how to make the original split between the front and the secondary. Even if you are short on men, you cannot skimp on the front side allocation. But this ultimately puts a lot of pressure on the front. If it fails to stall the initial attack, the secondary might not be enough to corral the enemy's larger advance. And if the attacker gets behind all of the defense, then, in this case, much of the Surovikin line's fortifications would cease to be effective. Ukraine's ideal case would therefore be to puncture through, push out to the coast, and then turn the offensive to the sides. Sustaining offensive operations for that long is difficult, of course. For example, despite running roughshod over Russia east of Kharkiv, Ukraine still had to culminate its offensive there. But short of stretch goals to the coast, Ukraine wanted to see some sort of defensive breakdown that would lead to dominoes falling and notable cities being reacquired. Act 3. The Attack As the calendar pushed deep into the spring, a disagreement formed within the American and Ukrainian strategic planning communities. The United States wanted Ukraine to get moving, worried that longer delays would only make the problems with the Sorovikin line worse. In contrast, Ukraine wanted to wait, so Rovikin line be damned. The blue and yellow troops saw the mud on the ground firsthand, and believed that drier conditions would be more favorable. That delay would take things to the precipice of summer. Ultimately, June 7th would set the tone of things to come. In the center of Zaporizhia, east of the crook in the river, Ukraine made its move. Troops began to congregate, awaiting final clearance for the long-awaited combined arms operation. The objective for the first day was to push a few kilometers to the village of Robotine, and to extend past it within four days. What happened there would determine the next steps. The likely target afterward would be Tokmak, further to the south, and the real prize for the year was Melitopol, yet further south. But back near Robotine, the line was working as intended. Bradley fighting vehicles had to operate through narrow corridors of cleared minefields. The feared mud indeed bogged them down, all while Russians sat on the high ground and fired missiles at them. After four days, the time by which Ukraine was supposed to reach past Robotinye, command ended the attack without much to show but plenty of lost materiel. This was not the only vector of attack, of course. Ukraine also consistently applied pressure further east, just inside Donetsk and around Bakhmut. But the process was slow going throughout. The Surovikin line, even with its namesake no longer in the picture, was holding as Russia intended. Meanwhile, despite managing to avoid the limelight, helicopter teams helped resolve the issues with the thin Russian secondary. The key here was distance. They stayed far away from the front lines, in places like Bardyansk. This kept them out of range of HIMARS, at least for the Gimler's missiles that the United States was offering at the time. But they were close enough to deploy wherever Ukraine pushed the pressure. 
For Russia, the helicopters and the defensive lines were the perfect match. Meanwhile, the optimism in Ukraine from the beginning of the year was gone. This would be no repeat of the 2022 offensives. Act 4. The Reassessment For all the bad news, the bright spot for Ukraine was that strategists had successfully diagnosed the problem. The phrase, NATO combined arms operations, has the word combined in there for a reason. But Ukraine's air force was still operating an antiquated Soviet fleet. In contrast, Russia had updated its aircraft and could simply outrange whatever Ukraine could launch into the sky. Now, the West had the answer, F-16 fighter jets. But that aid was not forthcoming. Looking at the big picture, Russia's economy dwarfs Ukraine's, but NATO's collective economy dwarfs Russia's. If both sides were to fully mobilize, there would be little doubt what would happen next. Well, at least for the conventional portion of the conflict. If you ever wondered why does NATO, the largest military, not simply eat the other, that is your answer. However, as it relates to Ukraine, there are fundamental differences in the incentive structures. Russia is a single state, which, under Putin, is determined to capture some swath of Ukrainian territory. NATO, in contrast, is a collection of countries. All of them would prefer that Russia leave. Okay, fine, almost all of them. But forcing that to happen will be a costly endeavor. For each country, it would be nice to free ride off of the efforts of another NATO member. You get the same geopolitical outcome, but get to spend your money on something at home and just for yourself. The manifestation of this free-riding incentive varies from member to member. The countries that share major land borders with Russia, or de facto share a border, have been more inclined to pony up, as they see spillover consequences more directly affecting them. Meanwhile, the United States, the United Kingdom, and France have been more involved because they have broader geopolitical interests. But even each of those is still feeling the free-riding incentive to some degree. That is why, going back to the beginning of the invasion, you see the bizarre hodgepodge of aid to Ukraine. Canada gave hundreds of thousands of sets of winter gear. Chechia donated two pontoon bridges. Finland sent along 70,000 field rations. Luxembourg pitched in 15 tents. Slovakia poured in 2 million liters of aviation fuel. These donations were not being made because they were the things that Ukraine needed. To be clear, Ukraine did benefit from the aid. No one in Kyiv was complaining. But what was really happening here was that each state was going through its warehouses, was seeing what needed to be cleaned out anyway, and was giving those supplies to Ukraine rather than throwing the goods in the dumpster. This problem did improve over time, but it still left Ukraine in puzzling positions, like attempting a combined arms operation without the combined arms, something that no NATO country would ever think about doing. Ukraine's solution was to get out and walk. Literally. The lighter footprint made it more difficult for Russia to spot an attack, and it reduced the vulnerability of a vehicle getting stuck in the dirt. While safer, the strategy was painfully slow. Ukraine eventually did make it past Robotinye, but the length of time was measured in months, not days, and visions of reaching Tokmak, Melitopol, or the coastline never came into focus. Act 5. The Culmination The Freerider problem eventually manifested itself in a second way. Offensive operations require a surplus of soldiers and supplies to be effective. The binding constraint on Ukraine's offensive was artillery shells, specifically the NATO standard 155mm model. Without an abundance of them to soften the opposing trenches and artillery systems, any offensive operation is doomed for immediate failure. That goes double when you do not have air support. But the problem here is that shell production has long been a sore point within NATO, and the war has done little to change that. Biden, as the de facto head of the Western coalition, 
could not find a solution to the complex structural problem. He is not the first president to get annoyed by allies wanting to underproduce military capacity, and he will not be the last. But he was feeling it more than most because an actual war was ongoing. As the year wore on, Biden also began feeling the squeeze from the halls of Congress. No country was immune to the free-riding dynamics. For its part, Russia has also had problems manufacturing various components of its war machine. Indeed, the Kremlin has been resorting to outsourcing some production to Iran and North Korea. But those countries are not contributing out of the goodness of their hearts. Moscow is directly paying for it. And unlike NATO countries, there is no free rider problem internally. Either Russia does it, or no one does. And while the benefits of the Ukrainian victory are dispersed across the NATO countries, any benefits of a Russian victory stay squarely inside of Russia. With the artillery stockpiles dwindling and the weather beginning to turn, Ukraine's offensive hit a natural stopping point. The net territorial gain was positive for Ukraine, but well short of what Western observers had hoped for at the beginning of the year. Epilogue. The next phase. The public narrative in the West has seemingly shifted from bright optimism to dark pessimism. But this has the markings of a clear overcorrection. As far as disasters go, this was a fairly mild one for Ukraine. Had Ukraine maintained the tactics that it was using at the beginning of July, the situation would have become an absolute mess. Enough metal and men would have been lost, that Ukraine would have needed years to recover. But that is not what happened. Ukraine quickly realized the problem and stopped the loss. There was no complete breakdown in Ukraine's martial capacity that Russia can now exploit. In fact, since Ukraine's offensive operations culminated, Russia has attempted similar combined arms maneuvers around Avdivka, and the results have been comparable to what Ukraine experienced earlier with the notable difference that Russia seems to keep pressing on anyway. That is, they are making small gains, but coming at high costs. Meanwhile, the West eventually made progress on giving Ukraine the aid that it needs. Artillery stocks got a boost in July when Biden approved the transfer of 155mm shells with cluster munitions, which spread out shortly before impact to pepper the target area with bomblets. In October, Biden also approved Attackums missiles. These go into the HIMARS system, and can travel substantially further than the Gimler's missiles that were central to the 2022 offensives. The particular model had a maximum range of 160 kilometers, and also featured cluster munitions. Ukraine's first strike was on an airfield full of those same Alligator helicopters that were stationed at a distance in Berdyansk, and stifled any potential breach of the front lines. They were, in fact, the perfect target for a cluster munitions attackums. High-speed aircraft do not fare so well when they have a bunch of small holes in them. And at some point in 2024, Ukraine plans to begin flying F-16s. Summing up, with extra artillery to spare, long-range missiles disabling Russia's mobile secondary, and F-16s softening everything else. One wonders whether the 2023 offensive would have looked very different if all of this had arrived in January. As it stands now, the West still needs to resolve its collective action problem, if Ukraine is to obtain the level of aid that it wants. For the time being, though, Kyiv finds itself in a bit of a catch-22. It needs to make progress to convince would-be freeriders to give aid, but it needs that aid to make that progress. Backtracking a bit, Catch-22 is a great book about war. The same could be said, of course, about my new book on the strategy of the conflict that goes right up until the start of Ukraine's summer 2023 offensive. Or get some classic lines on maps from the OG text. And if you enjoyed this video, Please like, share, and subscribe, and I will see you next time. Take care.